Well, as you guys know, I love, uh, I love talking about my kids, but I love talking with my kids more. Um, it's the most fascinating experience I ever have is just to listen to my, my son ask, ask questions. And if you, if you ever talk with kids or if you do that on a regular basis or you have kids, you know that they ask uh, the questions that we sort of take for granted. And, and a lot of time what happens with me is they'll ask me a question like, why do we have two eyeballs instead of one? And, you know, that's something I'm, I, like, don't think about on a regular basis. But uh, when they ask me, I, I think immediately, oh, that's easy. And then I start to try to explain it to a four-year-old. And it becomes very hard to explain why do we have two eyeballs instead of one eyeball. And it just becomes this great question. Um, th- they ask questions like, why does the oven beep? Why do we put cheese on our bagels or cream cheese on our bagels? Why do dogs wag their tails? Why do baby, babies come from their mommy's belly? Why are their mommies and daddies? Uh, Why do fish live underwater? Why is there a speed limit? These are all the kinds of questions that I get on a regular basis. And these are things that we don't really think to ask, but they do. I saw a question a kid asked one time. He asked, why are there little gaps in between the comb, uh, on the comb in between the little sharp parts? It's like, how do you answer that question? I have no idea. But when it comes to Christmas and when it comes to Jesus and when it comes to theology, I really do think there is a question uh, we're going to cover today that we sort of take for granted, but if you really start to think through it, it's hard to answer. It's really hard to answer this particular question, and we think we know the answer, but then we get into it. And I thought about this question, and I thought, have I ever heard a sermon about this? Have I ever, have I ever heard a message on YouTube about this? And I really don't think I have. I've heard people talk about related items and related topics, but I don't think I've ever heard anybody preach about this particular question. And so as I thought through Scripture and I thought through who Jesus is and I thought through why he came at Christmas and and why it was that Jesus came, this is the question that I want to cover this morning. Why did God send his son and not send someone else? And that's kind of like one of those questions, like, why do fish live underwater? It's like you hear that and you're like, that's easy. But then you start to think about it. Why would God send his son, his eternal son, and not someone else. And the reason I ask it that way is because if you read the Bible through, up until the time of Jesus Christ appearing, God uses everyone else besides his son. God uses men and women, great prophets, great kings, great teachers, great leaders. You've got Ezra, you've got Nehemiah, you've got David, you've got Moses. You've got all these incredible humans. And God uses them. You've got the judges So why didn't God just send someone like them? Why not someone else? So I want to give you sort of a a sneak peek, a partial answer to the real answer to sort of whet your appetite. But God sent his son and not someone else because of the nature of his son. Because of the nature of his son. Because of who God's son is. Because of what God's son is. Because of who he is in his very nature, there was no other possible person who could give us eternal life than the eternal son of God. Moses wouldn't cut it. David wouldn't cut it. The prophets wouldn't cut it. Ezra couldn't cut it. Abraham, if he appeared, couldn't cut it. Elijah, if he reappeared, he couldn't cut it. No one but the eternal son of God can save you. No one but the eternal Son of God can give you eternal life, no matter how godly they are, no matter how special the circumstances of their birth, no matter how called of God they were. There was no other person that could give us eternal life. And so to sort of step through the door of this topic, what I want to do is I want to bring up two famous heresies in church history. And these famous heresies, Arianism... And Ebionism, okay, big fancy words, they're not complicated, but Arianism and Ebionism, these two heresies denied that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. They denied that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. Here's Arianism. God created Jesus before he created the world. Jesus is God's created Son, but he's not God's natural Son. In other words, this guy in the 4th century Arius, he comes along and he's got this sort of sharp theological system that's tricky. And what he says is, God always was, God always is eternal, 
And in between God's existence and the existence of the world, God created his son named Jesus. He just made him. And God called this person Jesus his son. This is Arianism. This automatically makes Jesus, number one, not God's eternal son, and number two, less than God. The second heresy is this, Ebionism, that Jesus is not God's eternal son. Jesus was a great man who was adopted by God. So, so Jesus, in other words, is kind of like King David. He, he was born, he was a special man, he was a great man, he was a, he was a good man, and God looked out on Jesus and he said, I want to adopt Jesus as my son. And so both Arianism and Ebionism would both say Jesus is God's son. But they would mean nothing like what we mean. They deny that Jesus has always existed. They deny that Jesus is God, and they deny that Jesus has always, forever, without beginning, and without end, been the very son of the Father. Now, if you lose Jesus as the eternal son, if he is not the eternal son of God, I have bad news for you. There is no eternal life for you and me. If Jesus is a created being, if Jesus is a mere creature, and here's my whole claim, if Christ is not God's eternal son, then he cannot give you eternal life. If he was just made, if he was just adopted by God, if he was just some kind of other great man, just like the prophets and Moses and Elijah and all the rest, then there is no possible way that Jesus Christ can save you and no possible way that he can give you eternal life. That's where this is headed, right? And so what I want to start with is our need. What you and I need and what Christmas is all about, Christmas is all about God sending his son to give us eternal life. Read John 3, 16. You see that God sending his son into the world is all about you not perishing, but having eternal life. All about me not dying in hell under God's wrath, but having eternal life, which we do not deserve. And so we have to get the need right. Because apart from God, we are simply dead in sin. Apart from God, we have no eternal life. Our sin has crushed the relationship between us and God, completely separating us from the eternal life of God. It's hard for me to think about my own kids not yet having eternal life. They have life and plenty of it. Our house is a war zone. (laughs) Our house is absolute chaos. They treat it like it's a track meet. Just round the kitchen and living. I mean, there's, I mean, we had to repaint like all of our walls recently, and then we've only been in the house three years. It's crazy. They're throwing footballs off the wall. They have plenty of life. They have plenty of physical energy. But my kids, and just like we, when we are born, we are dead in sin, separated from God, lacking eternal life. Ephesians 2 tells us this. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead in your sins, lifeless, completely separate from God. Romans 6.23, we love to memorize this one with our kids. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think that sometimes we hear this and we think that death is only referring to physical death. But it's not. Because eternal life is the opposite of death in this verse. This is talking about eternal spiritual Death, separation from God, alienation from the very being and life and fellowship of our creator. The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ. Romans 7 goes on and says, What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. I was alive... But when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. Sin kills us. And when I say sin kills us, sin completely cuts us off from the Trinity. Sin completely cuts us off from the one who can give eternal life and from the one who is eternal life. One more. Ephesians 4, 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding. Watch this language. Alienated from the life of God 
because of the ignorance that's in them due to their hardness of heart. Sin is alienation from the life of God. It kills us, meaning we lack eternal life. This is what is most precious in life, eternal life. Eternal life is what you should give anything or do anything to find and get. Like Jesus' parables where he says, go and sell all you have and buy the field with the pearl in it. Just give it all away and find the field with the pearl. You need the pearl of great price. This is eternal life. Without it, death. Without it, wrath. Without it, the great day of God is a terrible day. But with it, it's the best of days. Jesus Christ is coming back. As we go shopping at Walmart and we go on Amazon and we take life, you know, frivolously and lightly and we, we drink hot chocolate, these are all fine things. But it's so easy for our minds to get so distracted from the weighty realities of God and his son, Jesus Christ. To get so fixated on this earth, to get so fixated on our wish list, to get so fixated on our jobs and our spouses and even our kids and what house we own and what car we drive and what we're doing for the holidays and where we want to build a cabin. It's so easy for us to just fixate on these things that we can see, but there is a great day of God coming Jesus Christ will split the clouds open and he will descend. And what you need before that day is to meet him. You need eternal life before that day. There's nothing more valuable than eternal life through Jesus Christ. Because we do not come into this world with eternal life. We come into this world completely separate from God. And we need to be reconciled to our maker. Second point. As God's eternal son, Jesus has life in himself. Okay, so earlier I said, what did I say? I said that if Jesus is not God's eternal son, he can't give you eternal life. So us having eternal life completely rests on Jesus being God's eternal son. As God's eternal son, Jesus himself has life in himself. This speaks of Jesus right here, John 1. In the beginning was the word. This is Jesus. And the word was with God, He's somehow distinct from God the Father, and the Word was God. In other words, Jesus, who is the Word, the Son of God, he is also God. He is God in all of his being, in all of his essence, in all of his nature. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, through the Word, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, here is what I want you to see. I've never thought so clearly than this week about this verse. We usually skip over verse 4. We like verses 1 through 3. We skip right over verse 4. In him was life. In Jesus, in the word of God, before the beginning, before the world was made, in him, with the Father, was life. In him is life. This is not talking about Jesus getting life by coming into the world. This is talking about Jesus having life in himself before the world was. Jesus is God, and Jesus has life in himself. In the beginning, with God, he had life, and the life was the light of men. Same gospel, John chapter 5, verse 21, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Whatever the Father can do, the Son can do. If the Father can give life to people, then the Son can give life to people, because in Jesus is life. I'm going to just read a few scriptures that show you that in Jesus is life eternal, that he is the God of life. John 5, 25, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as, now this is so key, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Again, This is not talking about the incarnation. This is talking about eternity. That the Father has life as God, now the Son also has life as God, as the Word of God. This harkens us back to the verse we just read. In Him was life forever with the Father and with the Spirit. As the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son also to have life in Himself. John 10.10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I came, I came into the world to give life, to give true, eternal, abundant life. John 11, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. 
He's talking about Lazarus. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe you're the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. I don't just give life. I am the life, Jesus says. In me is life. The Father has life. He's granted the Son to have life in himself. John 14, you know this one probably by heart. Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. Notice the I am. I don't just give life. I am life. I am the life. Because I have life in myself, I am the eternal Son of God. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now what I want you to notice in John 17 is that Jesus in his prayer defines what eternal life is. This is key. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. Now watch this definition of eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. This is the definition Jesus gives of what eternal life is. Now let's just pause and think about this. I want to, I want to ask a question that I didn't plan to ask you. If I had asked you what eternal life is, before this message, what do you think you would have said? How would you define it? If I was like, hey, Susie, Johnny, whatever your name is, what is eternal life? Define that for me. What is eternal life? What would you have said? And I think a lot of people think about eternal life not so much as a relationship with God and fellowship with God and the experience of communion with God. I think most of us think about eternal life as transactional. Eternal life is simply forgiveness of my sin. Or eternal life is simply God calling me righteous. Or eternal life is something that's simply in the future when Jesus comes. Or eternal life is simply the resurrection of our bodies on the last day or something to this effect. I think that most people in in our world, if you just ask them, what is eternal life? I think a communion and fellowship with the living God would not be their primary answer. I think it would be more about a transaction. More about how I can sort of get right with God, get what I really need, and then sort of move on and maybe touch and go with God. Maybe talk to God, maybe have fellowship with God, maybe God's a little bit part of my life. But eternal life is more of just, I'm getting what I need to get out of hell, I'm getting what I need to live forever, and have eternal bliss, and even if that eternity was without God, I would still be pretty satisfied. I think that's probably how most people in this world think about eternal life, but Jesus says, eternal life is knowing God. It is knowing God. It is having fellowship and communion with God. It's not simply a transaction. It's not simply getting your sins wiped away, as important as that is. It is not simply about the future or some place of eternal bliss without God right at the center. Eternal life is having God in your life and you with God. That's what eternal life is. A few more things to show you this and then we'll close. This is how the same author, John, teaches us about Jesus in his letter. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, he's talking about Jesus, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Remember, in the beginning was the word, in him was life. Jesus is the word of life. Notice what he calls Jesus. He calls Jesus the life. He doesn't call him the one who has life. He calls him the life. He's the word of life. The life was made manifest. We have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life. 
Look how he calls Jesus eternal life. He literally calls him eternal life. He is the life. He is the eternal life. He is the word of life. He doesn't just have life. He doesn't just give life. He is eternal life. Don't you love that? That's incredible. It is who he is. That's why at the very beginning I said, if Jesus isn't the eternal son of God, he can't give you eternal life. It's all about who Christ is. It's all about what he is. He is life. He is the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. What does it mean to have eternal life? It means to have fellowship with the true and living God. Jesus Christ is not just giving us life, he is life. He is the eternal life who came into the world as life. He goes on to say this, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe, in, believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life This life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. If you want eternal life, you need Jesus Christ. If you want eternal life, you have to receive Jesus Christ. If you want to experience the abundance of eternal life, you must walk closely and near to Jesus Christ. He must be the center of your world, the center of your existence. Everything about you needs to orbit around Jesus Christ and knowing him and treasuring him and enjoying him and having fellowship with him and making him look great. This is what Christmas is about. Christmas isn't about baby Jesus staying in the manger. Christmas is about baby Jesus growing up to be a man and dying on a cross and rising from the dead as the word of life to give you life and to give the world life. That we might have abundant life. And this life is not found in simply making a transaction with Jesus and walking away from him. It's found in having Jesus all in our life. It is getting Jesus himself. It's not getting stuff from Jesus. It's getting Jesus. That's what I want for Christmas. I want Jesus. Judah just got a, uh, uh, he's into puzzles now. So we just had the 48-piece puzzles, and now we just graduated to the 70-piece puzzle. And the puzzle now he has is sort of our solar system. And yesterday I was telling him, I said, this this big sun is right in the middle. I said, Judah, everything in this solar system orbits around the sun. Everything orbits around the sun. Our lives should orbit around knowing the sun, having the sun, experiencing the sun, understanding the sun, worshiping the sun, glorifying the Son, longing for the Son of God to come back, wanting more and more of the Son of God. Because He is life. There is nothing greater than Him. There's nothing more valuable than Him. There's nothing more glorious than Him. And I have to ask, how are your affections for Jesus? Have they grown dull? Because I'm back there singing songs with tears in my eyes because I want nothing more than Jesus. I I I want Him to be glorified. And I would hate for us to walk in this room and just kind of go through the motions and get the feels about Christmas and completely ignore the one who is life. He's so important. He's so valuable. He's so great. If you've tasted and seen that he is good, you will thirst and hunger for him. Jesus can give you eternal life because he is. He is eternal life. Jesus gives you eternal life by giving you himself. Jesus loves you so much that not only would he die for you and rise for you, but flowing out of those saving actions, he would give himself to you. He's not one that just just washes you clean of sin when you put your faith in him. He's one who washes you clean of sin so that you can have fellowship with him. 
Forgiveness opens the door to fellowship with Christ. Forgiveness is a pathway. It removes the barrier to having the living God living in you. And I know in many ways I'm preaching to the choir this morning. I'm preaching things that I've preached for for six years. I know that some of you know this stuff, but do you live this stuff? Do you want this stuff? Will people look at your life this Christmas and say, man, this person is brimming over with the glory of Jesus Christ, with love for Jesus Christ and knowing his love for them. Like what, what their life orbits around is the Son of God. I hope people would say that about you, that that would be your passion. Jesus gave himself for you on the cross so that he give, can give himself to you in fellowship. He gave himself for you that he might give himself to you. Paul said it this way, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in us. Christ filling us, filled to the fullness of God. There was a wealthy man and his son and him loved to collect rare works of art. They had everything in their collection, Picasso's, Raphael. They would sit together, admire these works of art. And when the Vietnam War broke out, the son went to war. He was extremely courageous and he died in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was notified and deeply grieved for his only son. About a month later, just before Christmas, there was a knock at his door. And a young man stood at the door with a large package in his hand. And he said, Sir, you don't know me, but I'm a soldier, one of the ones your son gave his life for. He saved many lives that day, and he was carrying me to safety when a bullet struck him in the heart, and he died instantly. He often talked about you, sir, and your love for art, and how you'd spend time together. The young man held out his package. I know this isn't much. I'm not a very great artist, but I think your son would have wanted you to have this. The father opened the package. It was a portrait of his son, painted by the young man. He stared in awe at the way the soldier had captured the personality of his son in the painting. The father hung the portrait over his mantle. Every time visitors came to his home, he took them to see the portrait of his son before he showed them any other works of art. The man died a few months later, and there was a great auction for his paintings. Many people gathered, many wealthy people excited to see the great paintings and have an opportunity to purchase some of them. On the platform sat right in the center the painting of the son. The auctioneer pounded his gavel. We'll start the bidding with this picture of the son. Who will bid for this picture? There was complete silence. Then a voice in the back of the room shouted, we want to see the famous paintings, not this one. But the auctioneer persisted. Will someone bid for this painting of the son? Who will start the bidding? $100, $200. Another voice piped up. We didn't come to see this painting. We came to see the Van Goghs and the Rembrandts. Get on with the real bids. But still the auctioneer insisted, the son, who will take the son? Finally, a voice came from the very back of the room. It was the longtime gardener of the man and his son, a poor man. He said, I'll give $10 for the painting. It was all he could afford. The auctioneer said, we have $10. Who will bid $20, $20, anybody? And they all screamed back, give it to him for 10. Let's see the real paintings. The crowd was becoming anxious and angry. So the auctioneer pounded the gavel saying, going once, going twice, sold for $10. A man sitting on the second row shouted, now let's get on with the real collection. But the auctioneer laid his gavel down. He said, I'm sorry, the auction is over. When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will. I was not allowed to reveal it until this time. Only the painting of the sun would be auctioned. Whoever bought the painting of the sun would inherit everything, the estate and all of these great works of art. The man who took the son gets everything. Everything. And he reflects what 1 John says that we read. If you have the son, you have life. You have everything. You get everything because he is everything. Is Jesus everything for you? I'm not up here to give you some cute little Christmas sermonettes. Is Jesus everything for you? So I'll close with a few questions. 
Do you want Jesus himself this Christmas or do you just want his forgiveness? Do you want Jesus? He is life. How important is your relationship with Jesus today? How important is it? How important is it for you to be near to Jesus, to walk with the one who is life? On a scale from one to 10, how would you rate that? That passion, that desire, that thirst, that hunger? What needs to stop in your life or start in your life so that nearness to Jesus is your top priority? What needs to stop? What needs to start? What do you need to pray about? What do you need to confess and repent of? What sin patterns are weakening your relationship with Jesus Christ? What rhythms of relationship with Jesus do you need to prioritize? Do you have a relationship with Jesus at all? At all? Because he came to give you eternal life. The Bible says if you will hear about Christ, crucified for your sins, risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, if you will repent and call upon his name through faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And we want to baptize you. We want to baptize you as soon as we possibly can in response to Jesus Christ. So if you would like to start a relationship with Christ and call upon his name, Maybe there is just one person in here this morning that needs Jesus Christ and needs to start a relationship with Christ. Call upon his name in prayer today before you leave this place. Come talk to me. We want to baptize you. We want you to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you to check your life and your heart this morning and say, is Jesus my all in all? What's weakening and hindering my passion for him? What rhythms of relationship with Jesus do I need to re-implement or strengthen or devote myself to? so that I can have deep, intimate fellowship with him. Father, we thank you for your your mighty word that just testifies that Jesus is life, life abundant, life eternal, that he is the eternal life, who is with the Father and was made manifest to us. We thank you so much that this eternal life, Jesus Christ, was sent and came into the world to give life to us who are dead in our sins. We have no hope without him. We have no life without him. We have no purpose without him. There's nothing greater to find. There's nothing greater to have than your your perfect, wonderful son. And Lord, we, we we want our hearts to be enthralled with your son, for he is the image and glory of the Father. We want to love what you love the most, which is your holy son. And we want to make him known to others around us. We want to tell them of his wonders. We want to tell them of his grace. We want to tell them of his death and resurrection that he died to forgive our sins, and forgiveness is this this pathway to fellowship. It removes all barriers. It flings the gates of heaven wide open that we might have fellowship with a holy God. And we want to fellowship with him even now, remembering him in communion. As he said, do this in remembrance of me, as, as Christ always promised to be among us, as we see him walking among the churches in the book of Revelation, that he really is, through the spirit of Christ, among us. And so we're so grateful to take communion. We're so grateful to be here together. We're so grateful to be challenged by your scripture. We're so grateful to have fellowship. We're so grateful for your love for us and for our families, for our friends. We're so grateful to take communion. And so we take a moment just to think on that. We love you so much and we pray in the great name of Jesus. Amen.